the today uh, the lesson I got um, is, you know, trusting today uh, the God that cannot lie. You know, um, a couple of years ago, been some time ago, I think close to two years ago, our pastor uh, in the middle of a message put in a phrase. He said, "The two most dangerous days in a Christian's life." Does anyone remember what those two most dangerous days in a Christian's life is? Yeah, that's exactly right. The thing is, you can't live in either one of them, but they can rob you of today. And yet I think a lot of people have lots of regrets. Uh, They have things that haunt them from their past, and it robs them of their joy today. Uh, and then there's fear of tomorrow. There's a lot of uncertainty about tomorrow. I mean, uh, you know, I think it would probably do us all a lot of good just to quit watching the news. It just gives me nothing but anxiety. Uh, you know, they rarely have a good story. Uh, uh, but um, the thing is, um, the um, what we have to learn to do since we can't live in yesterday, and that's what we're going to look at here in Philippians uh, chapter 3, Paul writes, and starting in verse 13, it says, Brethren, I count, I count not myself to apprehend, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now think with me about the life of Paul. As Saul, he was there to stoning of Stephen. He, he was the one that brought the accusation against Stephen. And so he was responsible for Stephen's stoning. And then he persecuted the church, casting people into prison, even having some put to death, and forcing other people uh, to blaspheme against God. And they, and they did a lot of cruel things back then, even to the point of taking your children and being willing to torture your children in front of you until you would deny the faith. And you just ask yourself as a parent what a place that would put you into. And so there's Saul, and he says, but I forget those things in the past. But also here's Paul, who God allowed to write 13 books of the Bible. And he's also saying, I forget those things. And so I think one of the things for us that have been in the faith for a while, which a lot of people who are very faithful to Wednesday night services have been in the faith for a while, one of the things that we need to be real careful of is that we forget everything we've ever done for the Lord because that's already done. And never get to the mindset of thinking, well, I've done enough. It's time for some of the younger folks to come in. Now, physically, there may be like when it comes time to move all the furniture around and stuff, it may be time for some of the younger guys. But there's a work for us to do. God's only got one retirement plan. When is that? It, it's a great one. It's out of this world. Uh, <laughs> but it's literal. It's literal. It's out of this world. Uh, and so we need to be careful. You know, Paul, like I said, he said, you know, um, brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it. In other words, to know everything. But this one thing I do, now think about that. Here's Paul, this great apostle, saying, if there's one thing I do, this is the one thing I do. Think about that just for a little bit. All the care of the churches that he had, all the books of the Bible, God let them write, and everything else. He said, you know, this phrase here, he goes, um, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. In other words, those things that have already passed. You can't change them. You can't add to them. Uh, and so you just got to put them there. You just got to leave them there. And um, so, and then uh, the thing, one of the things also be as a young Christian or even an older Christian, another thing that we've got to leave in the past is the hurts that we've either received or done to others because again we can't fix them there may be a few people we need to go to and say i'm sorry Uh, but the thing is we can't fix them we can't change them 
And, and so we've got to leave yesterday as yesterday. And we got and, and forget them, Paul says. Um, now, tomorrow, go with me, if you would, to James chapter 4. And in James chapter 4, starting in verse 13, James writes, says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow I will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. Um, the thing is, is you know, James isn't saying there isn't going to be a tomorrow, is he? He's just saying we don't have no promise of tomorrow. We don't have control necessarily of tomorrow. Um, so, you know, the thing we wind up having to do, if we, if we can't fix yesterday and we're not promised tomorrow, what, what are we left with? Today. That's right. That, that's what we're left with. We're left with today. But the thing is, are you willing to trust the God that cannot lie with today? And to find the peace and the comfort that comes from a walk with him today. You know, I, I guarantee you, you know, uh, all of us would love to have so much money in the bank that financially we don't have to worry about tomorrow. That would take a big load off a lot of us, wouldn't it? You know, a lot of people I know about my age, I'm 59, they get to that point where they're not quite where they could retire, and yet they worry about what would happen if I had to go find another job today. You know, I've told people, you know, if I let my company run into the ground, what do I write on my resume? You know, I ran this company into the ground, and I'm sure if you hire me, I can help you do it to yours, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the thing is, you know, the, there's a lot of people have a lot of stress they get about my age. I find a lot of folks, when they get right up to where they could retire, the stress just melts away and work becomes fun. Because they know that today it isn't fun, I'm going to quit. And I can quit. But it's those, those years when you're up to that point where not many people would really want to invest in a 59-year-old man. Your health insurance is high, more than likely Five, ten years from now, you're going to retire on me. They'd rather look for that 20-something-year-old that if they invest the time and training and everything like that, he's going to be there a while or has a chance to be there for a while. So there's a lot of stress that people bring on themselves worrying about tomorrow. Um, and the thing is, James is just telling us, you don't. there may be a tomorrow, but you don't have no control over it necessarily. You don't have no promise of it. But what you do have is today. But go with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 3. And in Romans chapter 3, the God that we serve today sits there and makes a statement to us, uh, Paul writing about it, starting in verse 23. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, though the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set to be set forth to be a propitiation through through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God says is a holy God, and as, if we look at ourselves, we know we're nothing but sinners. In fact, the scripture has told us in these verses here in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, and in the beginning, before, before our salvation, that knowledge should bring fear into your heart. Here's a holy God, and here's a wretched sinner. 
and it puts me in a position of God being my judge. But because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary, and if we his substitutional sacrifice on our account, if we will then put our trust in him, here's a holy God that looks down on a wretched sinner, Rick Morris, and the thing is, I'm still a sinner. I was a sinner when I got saved when I was 18, and Rick Morris here at 59 is still a sinner. How can a holy God have a relationship with me and call me his son and call me a joint heir with Jesus Christ? Well, the reason is, is because God is fair. God, God being holy, then God has to be just. And since the price was paid for on the cross of Calvary, he can't ask me to pay for it again if I'll put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have total confidence, not in Rick Morris, but I have total confidence in a God that cannot lie. And so because of that, I'm adopted into his family when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. God says here and says in his scripture in verse 23 or 26 of Romans chapter 3, he says, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, and talking about God the Father, that he might be just. In other words, here's a holy God having a relationship with a wretched sinner. But he's just in doing that. Now, how can a holy God have any type of relationship with a wretched sinner? Well, the thing is, the price has been paid. My sin's wrong with Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ took my place, and because of it, God looks at me as if the sin never happened. He can then be, as it says here in the scripture, the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The thing that I want to stress with you about today, this deal about that we can't live in yesterday and we aren't promised tomorrow. But guess what? You don't have to surrender your joy today and you don't have to live below your privileges today. Because you are, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you're, you're one of God's children. God the Father looks at you as if you're the very joint heir of Jesus Christ. In fact, when he looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ, literally sees his righteousness imputed to your account. I mean, can you imagine when we get to heaven? I mean, it's just remarkable for me to get to thinking about that, that on, when he looks at the name of Rick Morris, underneath the title is, he raised people from the dead. He healed lepers. He healed the blind. He healed all this. Because the thing is, if anything Rick Morris really did was listed there, I, I'd be in trouble. That's covered up. It, it, he, he refuses to impute, the Bible says, my iniquities. In other words, he refuses to record them. It's not like they didn't happen is the reason Jesus had to go to the cross. But the thing is, I don't bear that guilt no more. And I ought not let it control me. I ought not let the things of the past control me. That's the reason Paul says, I forget them. I don't let my accomplishments blind me to my duties today, and I don't let my, the guilt of things that I did as a lost person hold me back because I am a child of the king, my sins have been paid for. The very precious blood of Jesus Christ washed them all away. And I've got great and precious promises that have been made to me. Now, the other thing we want to look at is go with me to Galatians chapter 6. Again, talking about living in today and trusting God that cannot lie. And starting in verse 7, again, these are verses that are very common uh, to us. But starting in verse 7 of uh, Galatians chapter 6, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season 
we shall reap if we faint not. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are the household of faith. Now, you know, the scriptures teaches that through these verses that we're going to reap what we sow. Is, isn't that what it's telling us? Um, you know, you know, the thing is, and since the scriptures tell us that we're not promised tomorrow, but it doesn't tell us there isn't a tomorrow. Would you agree with me? He's not telling us there isn't a tomorrow. He's just telling us you don't have a promise of tomorrow. And also that God's in charge of tomorrow. But here's something. If you can, if you're going to reap what you sow, then the thing is you have an opportunity to shape your future. Would you agree with me? Because the seeds that you're planting today, you're guaranteed that you're going to reap a crop tomorrow, sometime in the future. Either rewards in this life or rewards in the heavenly life. So the thing is, the fact is you are shaping your future. You know, the, you hear the old saying, and I think it's the truth, that you are the sum total of your decisions that we've made to this point. Thing is, we have, through the grace of God, opportunities to do better even in the future. We've got to forget those things in the past because, you know, you know, when you plant, Brother Nolan's got a garden. I know other people have gardens here. But, you know, if you plant one seed in the garden, do you expect a plant to give you back one seed? No, you, you hope to get a crop, you know, uh, uh, quite a few. If you plant a tomato seed, you hope to get quite a few tomatoes off of it. And, and the thing is, that's the same way with what we sow. You're going to reap later, and you're going to reap more than what you planted. So the thing is, uh, um, yesterday, the seeds that we planted that we might look back and go, uh-oh, you know, I wish I'd have thought that one through better, you know, we can't change those. Now, we're going to talk about that in just a minute in another light. But the thing that you need to be real careful of, not only is it a matter of the seeds that you sow, but think of it this way. How many times have we had chances that we could have sowed seeds, but we neglected it? In other words, we could have been doing something beneficial with our life today, that would have reaped us something for us or our family in the future, and yet we missed our opportunity. You know, we neglected to plant our seeds. So it's not now some seeds we need to neglect planting, the ones that get us in trouble. But on the positive side, we need to be thinking seriously about our opportunities, the life that God has given us, and the opportunities we have to be a blessing to people, because the only way you can serve God is to serve others. I've never figured out a way yet to serve God without serving others. Can anyone figure out a way to do it? You know, you can enrich your own development by studying God's word and be prayerful for things to, to learn more and stuff, but I can't think of a way of serving God without serving others in some way. You, you're doing something to the benefit of others if you're serving God. Um, am I wrong in that? Can you, can anyone think of an example? I, I've honestly, I can't think of an example of where you're serving God and yet you're not serving others somehow. It's beneficial to others. It could be your financial giving to this church and then the ministries that go off of it. It can be praying for lost souls to get saved. It can, there's lots of different things we can do, but it's going to be hoping for things for others. Now, we need to pray for our own needs. Even Paul asked for people to pray for him for the sake of the ministries that he was involved in. So there's nothing wrong with praying for your own needs. But service is, um, for God, is going to be doing something for others. Now, you know, what, what did Paul say to do about yesterday? He said to forget it. Just forget it. But the thing is, I've got some seeds that I planted back then that I really, 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 really rather not reap. 
you know. Uh, and I think all of us, if we could reflect back on some life, there's some choice words that we use at different times that we wish we hadn't said. There's just different things in our life. But the Bible says we're going to reap them, right? Can God lie? No, he can't lie. But go with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, again, a real common verses, but it doesn't mean that uh, there's a reason why they're real common, because they work in people's hearts. And in Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What I see in these verses is, okay, there are some seeds that I planted back here that I wish I hadn't planted. But Paul tells me to forget about yesterday. So I got to. Because I don't know how those seeds that I sowed are going to manifest themselves. That's in God's hands. Would you agree with me? But guess what? When they do appear in my life, if from whatever point in life you decide this is going to be a changing point in my life and I'm going to live for Christ the best I know how, you can go to your heavenly Father and you can plead for grace and you can plead for mercy based on what the scriptures say here and that we have a high priest who, can, who is touched with our... In other words, he, he knows what it was like to be tempted. And the thing is, we have access to grace and mercy whenever those things arise in our life to get us through it. How many of the... Can you remember some of the Old Testament kings of Israel and Syria or Samaria who got in who were rebellious to God but then when they were approached by the prophet they humbled themselves and God stayed his hand I we I don't have the chapter and verses in front of me but I know there's several stories in the in the Old Testament where the kings humbled themselves they they put on sackcloth they they took off a royal apparel they humbled themselves before their God, and God stayed his hand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the thing is, the thing is, we can know that God will do the same. He's the same today as he was yesterday. If, if we've done some things in the past, we've got to forget them. We can't hang on to them. We can't live there. But we're going to reap what we sowed. But guess what? If we've been trying our best to live for Christ today, which is the only thing we're promised is today, and we're trying our best every morning when we get up, today I'm going to live for Christ the best I know how, then we're in a position to go to our Heavenly Father and plead for the mercy and the grace that we're going to need and either he may stay his hand, or he may sit there and just simply supply the grace that is sufficient for the moment. Thing is, he loves us. He, he's not unjust, and that reaping and sowing business is going to happen. has nothing to do with going to heaven. If you're saved, you're saved, and all that's took care of. But dealing with us because of what we've done, both positive and negative, but the neat thing is, as a Christian, is we've got a Father in heaven who can be touched. We've got a Jesus Christ. We've got a high priest sitting at the right hand of the Father who feels for us, loves us so much he went to the cross for us. And we can go to him and we can plead for mercy. You know, uh, we, we, we've got, we've got a, a good situation, so much more so than the lost person. But the other thing we see here 
is in Malachi. We, I won't have us turn there, but I'm going to... Well, let's just go there. Malachi chapter 3. Last book of the Old Testament. Michael Mills usually bets that I'll let us out early, so I'm going to keep us. It's all his fault. If I can just find the chapter, we may be here longer than we think. Chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 7. He says, um, Even from the days of our fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye say, Wherein shall we return? And then the Lord says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that you may, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. You know, it goes on to talk about that, how he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake if you do what's right. So the thing is, is reaping what you sow. Here's a situation that if you withhold the tithe, God says you're cursed with a curse. But he says, if you do what I tell you to do, if you obey my commandments, he said, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. That's a big blessing. But let me ask you the question. Because so many people want to find a gray area. You know, you know we're, and I think all of us at different times are guilty a little bit of it. And some more so than others. I want to find that, you know, yeah, but, you know, how about this? You know, uh, let me ask you this. How much room is there between a curse and a blessing in this one? You either bring it or you don't, right? Pretty, no, hard to sit on this fence and keep your balance. You're either cursed with a curse. Now think about that for just a second. If God wants to mess with you, do you really want to pick him as the guy that's going to, you know, he said you're either cursed with a curse if you don't tithe, or I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. It's a real clear picture to me about reaping what you sow. Would you agree with me? And, and so the thing is, it's not real complicated, this Christian life. It's rebellion or it's obedience. The thing is, if you're a new Christian and you hadn't been saved very long and you get to read in the scriptures or you hear a hard message preached and all of a sudden you go, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be doing that. Well, guess what? God knew you didn't know if you're a new Christian. And he doesn't ask you to be responsible. Now, if you refuse to study or don't come to church hardly at all, well, if the message was preached and you could have been there and you weren't there, shame on you. It's just like driving down the road and saying you didn't know what the speed limit was. It isn't a defense. Uh, but the thing is, as you develop as a Christian, God doesn't lay everything on you at one time. He develops you. He matures you. He gives you a chance to grow in the Lord. But as we get a chance to grow in the Lord, we need to make conscious decisions to live today. We can't fix yesterday. We're not promised tomorrow. But we are shaping our tomorrow by our walk today because we're going to reap what we sow. And so the, the, thing that we, the only thing we can do and what I would highly recommend is that you determine in your heart to be all in. In other words, I'm not going to be a timid Christian, but I'm going to be all in. I'm going to realize, as the God reveals in my heart the things he would have me to do, that's what I'm going to do. 
by the grace of God. Not in the flesh, not in the, you know, doing it in my own strength. But as God reveals to you what you should be busy doing, then do it. I, I, I've had, people have asked me before, how I wish I knew what God's will was for my life. I can give you what I think has been proven to me to work. Get busy doing all the things you already know you should be doing. And then when you're doing that, you'll be right in a perfect spot for God the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the next thing he wants you to do. The thing is, again, God doesn't promise us tomorrow, and so he gives us revelations about what's going to happen after this life, but he hadn't told any of us what's going to happen tomorrow, has he? We'd all be buying lottery tickets. No. Uh, the thing is, you know, it's just we're, 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 not, we're not we're told what's going to happen tomorrow. We're given today, and we're given choices, and we're going to reap what we sow. But the thing is, because we've been justified because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We've got exceeding and great promises that have been made to us. We should not walk around with our heads down. We have, we have the victory. Satan no longer controls us. we got a heavenly father that we can go to, and his, our Savior is sitting at his right-hand side, and we got God the Holy Spirit living in our heart, and we've got his word, and we've got brothers and sisters in Christ. We can, we can walk through this life victorious. And we should try to walk through this life victorious in confidence, not in self, but in our loving God that loves us. But then what we're going to have to do is realize every day that we need to agree to cooperate with God's will for our life. And it always comes down to that, doesn't it? I know what God, I know in my heart what God wants me to do. I mean, if most of us would wake up, we know what we're supposed to do. And we're either going to do it or we're not. And it's that what I'm just trying to make us rethink about a little bit tonight. I'm not teaching you guys anything new, but I am trying to remind you, since you do know, you are going to reap. But the thing is, it can be a great reward. And we can avoid the consequences because we just have to make that choice um, to live today for the Lord in a way that's pleasing to the Father, you know, trusting in that God that cannot lie. This world will throw so many curveballs at us, try to make us fearful, make us fretful. Lots of different things come out. Satan attacks from all different directions. Sometimes the attacks come from just places we never would have dreamed that we'd get attacked from. And it tries to rock us off our feet. But the thing is, we've got a God that loves us, and none of it's catching him by surprise. And we have to choose which one we're going to follow, our fears or our God. Proverbs 16 and verse 20 says, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and whosoever trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. Thank you all for your time tonight. Brother Ray DeMasters, God.